Well, he was uh, very supportive of science. His uncle, uh, John Trump, was a physicist at MIT, and we talked a little bit about him. I knew about his work. So I don't think science has anything to fear from Mr. Trump. You, you also say, uh, Professor Hamper, that the world is getting greener and people should stop hyperventilating. Flesh that out for me, please. Well, well there's this myth that's uh, developed around carbon dioxide that it's a pollutant, but you and I both exhale carbon dioxide with every breath, so each of us emits about two pounds of carbon dioxide a day, so are we polluting the planet? Uh, Carbon dioxide is a perfectly natural gas. It's just like water vapor. It's something that plants love. They grow better with more carbon dioxide. And you can see the greening of the earth already from uh, the additional carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Bill, Bill, tell us what your reaction is to, uh, to what he's, he's saying there. And, and what's the m most prolific misconception about climate change? What he claims to not understand is the rate. It's the speed at which we're adding carbon dioxide. And I will say, much as I love the CNN, you're doing a disservice by having one climate change skeptic and not 97 or 98 scientists or engineers concerned about climate change. What you got to get is the speed at which things are changing. But that aside, the science march today is about the economy as well as the environment. Although it's Earth Day, and I was here for the very first Earth Day in 1970, if you suppress science, if you pretend that climate change isn't a real problem, you will fall behind other countries that do invest in science, that do invest in basic research. And it's interesting to note, I think, that Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution refers to the progress of science and the useful arts. Uh, and useful arts in uh, 18th century usage would be what we would call engineering or city planning or architecture. Mm. So this is a very serious problem. When uh, Earth Day started in 1970, everybody's concerned about pollution. And uh, what happened a few years ago, the Environmental Protection Agency, which was started by Richard Nixon, who was a conservative president, and he started the Environmental Protection Agency for the greater good, not for political reasons. Well, let, let so, me... uh, so everybody understand that if we suppress science, the United States will not fare as well uh, on the international marketplace, and uh, we will lose business. Well, let me this let me is take this fundamental. Let me take this to to May, and I hate to interrupt here, but I, I don't want to go past this point. The president says that many of the rollbacks that he is uh, signing through executive order are for the purposes of increasing jobs, growing the economy. May, to that, you say what? I say that that doesn't make any sense based on what we know about the clean energy economy. If Trump and his ilk were serious about this problem, they would actually invest in the technologies of the future, in the sun and the wind, in retooling our energy economy, and create millions of jobs in the process. A lot has changed since 1970, and one of the scariest things is how we're seeing climate change as a problem affecting real people right now. From storms to droughts to flooding, this is a problem for this moment in time. That's why we're seeing so many people rising up. Today, we'll see the March for Science. I'm heading right there after this show. And then next Saturday, the People's Climate March will take place, April 29th. So we invite everyone watching to join and to mobilize as much as they can, because this issue, if we're going to do something about it, we have to change everything. And to change everything, we need everyone. So, William, you heard um, Bill there talking about your argument regarding uh, carbon dioxide. Science is supposed to be definitive for many people. What is not definitive to you about the science of climate change that you are a skeptic? Well, uh, let me point out that science is not like passing a law. You don't have a vote to see how many are for the law of gravity and how many are against. It, it's based on observations. And if you observe what's happening to, for example, the temperature, the temperature is not rising nearly as fast as the alarmist computer models predicted. You know, it's much, much less, it factors of two or three less. 
So the uh, whole basis for the alarmism is not true. It's, it's based on flawed computer modeling. That's completely wrong. And you don't vote on so, that. So you know, enjoy, you know, say what you will, but you have it absolutely wrong. So uh, what happened to that heat, and he's cherry picking a certain model, the heat ended up in the ocean. This is, this is not controversial in mainstream science, everybody. So let's, really, I encourage everyone to look at the facts. We've got an extraordinary situation here in the United States where climate change deniers have managed to introduce the idea that some uncertainty, say 2%, plus or minus 2% mm. about the temperature of the ocean is somehow equivalent to plus or minus 100%. Now everybody, science is political. We use politics to decide where to invest our intellect and treasure. But when it comes to climate change, that is not controversial in the scientific community any more than you made reference to the law of universal gravitation. So, sir, with some respect, I encourage you to cut this out so that we can all move forward and make the United States a world leader in technology. What we want are advanced wind turbines, advanced photovoltaics, advanced solar uh, concentrated uh, energy plants. And everybody, if we were to do that, we would have at least three million new jobs in the United States that could not be outsourced. We would not need to have a military on the other side of the world mm. defending what people call our oil. We could move forward and we could export this technology. We could be world leaders in this. Well, they, Instead of uh, wringing our hands and, and cherry picking data and pretending that this problem that's obvious to the scientific community is somehow not obvious to you. So let me, everybody, let, let's get to work. I love, Willie, My let parents me, were in let World me ask this War question. II. They let solved me, the global let me problem in, here. in five years. Let's go. William, let me ask you this question. The, the president will have to decide how, how to move forward on the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, something that was um, uh, a pact that was joined by 200 nations. Uh, with the, the president of Obama uh, a little more than a year ago. The president during the campaign said that he would quote unquote cancel that, has not done it yet. How would you advise the president if you had his ear on how to move forward on the Paris Climate Agreement? Well, you have to consider many things I think on the face of it. It should be canceled. I could imagine that you might want to consider, you know, ties with allies and things like that that uh, perhaps would make that not advisable, but I think it, it doesn't make any scientific sense. It, it's just a silly thing. I think it, to me, it's very similar to the Munich uh, agreements that Mr. Chamberlain signed. Wow. Okay. Everybody, care, bear in mind, this may backfire. If you pull out of an international agreement, other countries may uh, establish what are effectively tariffs on U.S. produced goods and especially services. So, uh, so other, but, but, hold on for a second, Mr. Harper, I just want to make sure that you are comparing the Paris Climate Agreement to the appeasement policy? It's definitely appeasement. Let me add also, you know, that as a group how, scientists how so? have often I, been I, I don't want to jump. Past. I don't want to jump beyond that. How is this comparable to Neville's appeasement uh, of Hitler? How was that? How was that an appropriate comparison? It is an appropriate comparison because it was a treaty that was not going to do any good. This treaty also will not do any good. Anyone who looks at the results of doing what the treaty says can see that the effect on the Earth's climate is, even if you take the alarmist computer models, trivial. It will not make any difference, and yet it will cause enormous harm to many people. I don't, okay. I don't, I, I hear your, your point there, but I don't know that the Listen, references there ever serve us, us well. May and, I, and I want to give May the last word here. Just kind of wrap up for us your feelings based on what you've heard thus far this morning. Well, I think it speaks for itself. We've got a movement that's trying to move the world forward to the clean energy economy to protect our communities from climate change. And we've got a conversation that is stuck in the past. Look, if you want to be part of this movement, we welcome you. And the only people who are trying to keep us in this outdated conversation is the fossil fuel industry who are protecting their profits. This climate denial only helps Exxon. It doesn't help the rest of us. But thankfully, we can do a lot better.